One thing I would ask any EMDR therapist, or especially a new EMDR therapist, is what were you taught about dissociation in your basic training? Because there are still basic trainers out there who can impart this message that you want to avoid dissociation like the plague, that dissociating is always bad. You know, dissociating is maybe in this question, preventing somebody from even doing a target assessment. So like, if that's the case, like you're doing a target assessment and you start to notice some of the first signs of dissociation, my first piece of direction without knowing the client's specifics would be, all right, this is what I'm noticing right now. Can you help me understand what's going on? You be curious about the dissociation instead of trying to shut it down. Dr. Jamie Marich, welcome back to the Art and Science of EMDR, and thank you so much for joining us. Rotem, it's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support of my work and my message within EMDR, and I'm excited to see what you've prepared in the way of questions and to see what I can present for uh, our folks. I'm wondering, though, if we can have people uh, use the chat who are here in real time to maybe introduce themselves if they want to identify where they're at, that would be lovely. And perhaps where you're at in your EMDR training journey. Yes, that would be great. So Jamie, I know that you and I, uh, we've known each other for, for a few years. And I know that a lot of our community members know you and your work, but we have a lot of new people here so if you don't mind presenting yourself and telling us a little bit about yourself and your journey and how did you come to do what you do? Yes. Oh, my great pleasure. Well, I think even your question is a great way to get us into the topic of the course today, because professionally speaking, I'm Dr. Jamie Marich. I'm the founder and director of the Institute for Creative Mindfulness. We're an EMDRIA approved training company. I've been in existence since 2015. We've trained thousands of EMDR therapists. I have a network who works with me. I've written 11 books and manuals in the field of trauma recovery, including three that are specific to EMDR. Rotem has two behind him right now, EMDR therapy and mindfulness for trauma-focused care, which I did with my colleague, Stephen Danziger, and then Dissociation Made Simple, which was last year's book. And then a flip chart is coming out this year. So that is Dr. Jamie, very much the public professional face that gets me invited into these spaces. Yet personally, we're just Jamie. And I'm actually going to change my Zoom name tag right now if I can, because often in these spaces, uh, when I'm invited to talk about dissociation and dissociative parts, we stylize it as Jamie Plus, because... There's this very personal Jamie who exists as a system of four individuals. And I'm sure we'll we'll get into talking a little bit more about those parts and how they work. Uh, I am somebody who was formally diagnosed with what is now called OSDD, otherwise specified dissociative disorder, in 2004. When we were diagnosed in 2004, it was by our first EMDR therapist. It was when we were in graduate school. It was when we had about two years in recovery from our addiction journey at that point. And when we were diagnosed with OSDD, our life suddenly made sense. I, I can put it no other way than our life suddenly made sense. And I am grateful and blessed and whatever word you might want to use that our first EMDR therapist was not scared of dissociative disorder. She was not scared of dissociation. She accepted me and my parts exactly as we are. So I was diagnosed in 2004. My EMDR training journey started around 2005, 2006. And this was something I didn't dare come out about in the field, that I am somebody with lived experience of a dissociative disorder. Yes, uh, I was very out in public about the addiction recovery part of my life. Yet even from my early days as an EMDR therapist, 
I sense this stigma, not just in the larger psychology community, but even in the EMDR community, that dissociation is just the hardest thing you could navigate. And people with DID and OSDD were not to be touched with EMDR. So our coming out journey was something that was very gradual. Our first book, EMDR Made Simple, came out in 2011. Uh, that's a book Rotem and I bonded over. And as I say in that book, I very much dipped my toe into coming out in 2011 because I believe I said something like complex trauma is a big part of my history. And there's been a lot of dissociation that goes along with it. And for many years, I would sit in EMDR training spaces at the EMDRIA conference, and I would hear people talk about dissociation and dissociative disorders, a lot of the experts, and get very frustrated. Yet, it still didn't feel safe to be fully out as Jamie plus with we pronouns with the level of comfort that I have now. I, I should say the pronouns I use are she, they, but you may notice even as I talk, it's very common for me to use singular we pronouns. And I've done that. We've done that since we were a child. We tend to vacillate between I and we. And uh, in 2018, because of some continued mounting frustrations in EMDR circles, because of some things that happened in our personal lives, which taught prompted us to give no more shits, uh, we decided to come out very publicly as we're not just Dr. Jamie, we are Jamie Plus, we are a dissociative system, and it's not something that I am ashamed of anymore. That's the uh, the the short story, Rotem, of who we are as a system, and uh, we thank you for giving us this space to talk very candidly about what it means to have parts today. I appreciate you speaking candidly. And I think if I remember correctly, uh, Jamie, you said that coming out as a system, as a person with OSDD was even harder than coming out a bisexual or with your addiction. Do I remember that correctly? Coming out as somebody who is a system, as somebody who uses we pronouns, as somebody who says, yes, I've been treated for a dissociative disorder. And to that, I would say, yes, OSDD has technically been my diagnosis. I prefer now to say I'm a person with dissociative identities because I no longer see it as a disorder because I think a lot of the most disordered parts of it have been treated. So that that's just a sidebar. But yes, it was the hardest coming out because coming out as somebody who was in addiction recovery, was just there at the beginning of my career. That was something I didn't even think I could hide. In 2015, I came out very publicly. I was out to a lot of people in my personal life, but in 2015, I decided to really come out and do more advocacy as a bisexual woman. And I was raised in a very conservative religious family. So that was not easy to have to tell them about my sexuality because I was going to go more public with it in the field. But yes, coming out in 2018, in the way that I did. I did it first in an article, which we published on the ICM blog, which was later picked up by the Mighty. And then later that summer at the EMDRIA, the EMDR International Association Conference, we used to have a, a meeting called Network of EMDR Trainers that met the day before the conference. And I had a very public coming out to my fellow EMDR trainers. And I have approached it as, listen, I've heard the way you've talked about us, me and my community. And I by and large don't like it. And this is what I have to say. And it was terrifying. It was absolutely terrifying. And fortunately, there were enough friendly faces in that room, people who I knew got it, that I felt we felt safe enough to do that. And then in 2019, we had a full presentation at the conference where we very much came out to the whole community as somebody with dissociative identities, who also happens to be a very polished professional in this field. <laughs> Yeah. I just want to take this moment and tell people who are listening to us to not be afraid to be public about who they are, because, you know, I get a lot of feedback about my book that was inspired by you and your book and your actions to just say what you think and be who you are. And because otherwise, what are we doing here? So again, I, I appreciate the genuineness. And I think for you, you kind of like paved the path for many people to be more candid, be more authentic with who they are. If that's the case, that's the finest compliment I can get that people are being, are feeling more 
able, willing, maybe even safer to come out, not necessarily with dissociative identities, but with whatever mm-hmm. identity you may hold that yeah. makes you feel unsafe amongst a group of professionals. Yeah. So Jamie, one of the things I appreciate about, you know, your approach to mental health is that you're acknowledging the ethnocentric approach that we have in our culture, in our medical field, in our mental health field. And I want to just a, a quick quote from the Association Made Simple, this, this book right behind me. You're saying, in listening to some of our indigenous contributors and practitioners of shamanic and Celtic healing arts, we obtain further insight into just how limiting perspectives of our psychology can be or perspectives of our Western uh, psychology can be. So can you say a few words about that, about our perspective and maybe about our arrogance as a culture to look at what we have, our approach as the right one and other cultures as they're primitive or they don't know, we know, we're smart, we know. Well, I'll happily speak to that. Uh, so another line I have, I think around that same place in dissociation made simple is that modern therapists, not just modern EMDR therapists can get hung up on this question of what model should I be using for parts work? And something I really hope to drop some knowledge about in the book is parts work existed before Dick Schwartz parts work existed before Carl Jung, who I see at least in modern psychology terms with his archetypes as the one who gave us a real workable parts model, that psychology existed before Freud and modern psychology, right? And so I think as conscious practitioners, especially if we do talk a good game about being inclusive and looking at the roots of where things come from, we have to look to indigenous approaches and indigenous practices. And that's not necessarily, you know, to copy them and make money off of them ourselves, because that's certainly a problem in the field. Yet to talk to elders and shamans in traditions who are willing to share their practices and their knowledge, and a lot of it is out there in book form for public consumption, and to see how have the people who have been healing since the dawn of time approached working with parts or approach psychology in general. And one of the most uh, precious contributors, and I say this with a heart full of compliment to the Dissociation Made Simple Project, which are the interviews that I did for that book that's behind you, uh, was by an Ecuadorian shaman named Julian Jaramillo, who's also now a Jungian depth psychology student, and he really appreciates Jungian depth psychology. Yet from his traditions in Ecuador, in which he was trained and ordained, I asked him, how would you view this thing that we call parts or archetypes? in modern psychology. And he said, it's understanding that a person's mythology is their reality. So I'm going to explain that a little further or break it down, but I want everybody to sit with that as a first kind of point of this, this talk and this workshop today, a person's mythology is their reality. So I asked Julian, what does that mean in your context? And he said, when a person comes for healing, we are interested in what are the stories that are meaningful to them? What are the stories from their place, their village, their country? And can we find myth and symbol in those stories to help them connect? And I will tell you all, friends, this is something that at least as a kid, before I knew anything about therapy, I kind of intuited into as my dissociative system was forming and a lot of my my fellow brothers and sisters and siblings in the dissociative disorders community will attest the same, that they figured out their internal world of parts and people oftentimes before they even saw a professional. And there is usually a lot of connection to movies, characters, stories, maybe spiritual traditions that an individual holds dear. So a little tip kind of based on that shamanic knowledge, based on my lived experience, based on what I've talked to, you know, with others in my community is that if you want to help a person to understand their internal world of parts, alters, whatever you're calling it, because we can get into those diagnostic distinctions if you want. But if I'm just saying in general, if you want to help a person really understand their internal world, Ask them questions like, what movies mean a lot to you? What books 
did you connect to? What characters, especially as maybe a young kid who was growing up in a lot of turmoil, did you find protecting or nourishing? And I'll share for us that it was the Wizard of Oz. I get emotional some days talking about it. And I, and I feel it coming on that as a four or five-year-old child, there was something about Dorothy needing to get home that just spoke to us. And Dorothy needed all of these parts of her, i.e. the character she met along the way to get home. And so, yeah, as a five-year-old kid, I wasn't able to be like, well, you know, the Tin Man is my protector and the Scarecrow is this and this. Is this. It was like, no, they were just parts of my heart that these characters spoke to. So I know a lot of questions that EMDR therapists have is, okay, let's say I'm even trained in a parts model. How do I broach it with a client? Ask them about the stories that are meaningful to them. Ask them about the characters they connect to, the landscapes they connect to. And you can follow that up with questions like, have you ever felt like Dorothy? Does it ever feel like your scarecrow is fighting with the Tin Man or that, uh, you know, Galinda and the witch are fighting? That There's just so many things. And if you're not familiar with the story that they give you, you can ask them to share that mythology with you. And then that could be a conversation starter to really help you and the client understand what is happening in their internal world. And that applies to people who might have diagnosable dissociative systems or disorders as the DSM would call it. But it also applies to this notion of the parts that all of us experience, regardless of whether there's a disorder or not. I mean, the one thing I really do give IFS a lot of credit for is having popularized in our field this idea that we all have parts even though i'm not like a strict adherent to the principles or tenets of ifs and i've you know shared this with dr schwartz that i give him credit for at least advancing this conversation that parts work is not something that is inherently connected to a pathology or a disorder that we all have aspects of self that we can discuss and i think those of us with dissociative disorders are now saying it's about time. Like, yes, we're glad the rest of you. Yeah, are... better late than never. That's right. Better <laughs> late than never. It's a very long answer to your question, yeah. but I hope people yeah. got something out of it. No, I think it's um it's a good and important um answer. And I'm wondering, Jamie, I think a lot of EMDR therapists are running into this oh. notion of how do I present parts to my clients in a non-pathologizing way. So how do I, how do I talk about parts? So my clients don't feel kind of like they're, you know, getting their protectors come up. I think part of what you got, part of what you got to do is really listen to your clients. And I know that sounds like common sense, but sometimes common sense isn't as common as we'd like it to be in our field. And Dr. Schwartz says this in his development of IFS, that he developed it from listening to his clients. And so in listening to your clients, you want to be aware of things they might say, like, you know, there's, there's some days I want to get sober and other days I don't, or there's a part of me that wants to, to do this. And, and another part of me that doesn't, I remember probably within my first, I'm going to share this story and she is comfortable with me sharing it. She now works in the field. Uh, My first year as a clinician, I was working in a community addiction treatment center. I was just barely starting to get trained in all of this trauma work. About 70% of the clients that we worked with were what in the US we call like court mandated clients who were sent because of some kind of criminal charge. And this woman, you know, I call back her to to my waiting room, 19, 20 year old had a, uh, I think what we call drunken disorderly charge for getting into a fight when she was drunk in a parking lot. And she comes and she plops down and she goes, you know, Jamie, I was debating the whole way here, whether I was going to bullshit you to get out of this or whether I was going to tell you the truth because it's about time I tell the truth. And I first thanked her for her incredible honesty. (laughs) And that really gave me an insight into, gosh, how many of our clients, even when they come in for their first intakes, are kind of going back and forth. Like, you know, do do I bullshit this or do I be candid? Because that could be scary and vulnerable. And so I just really hold space to kind of honor the two different sides of her that wanted to tell me two different stories. And that 
in my view, was a subtle parts intervention. And it really helped me usher in what Dr. Shapiro emphasized in EMDR is the importance of truth-telling agreements. You don't have to tell me what you think I want to hear. Now, I get it that you may have some big protective roadblocks within you that say that's unsafe. Don't tell her the truth. But we want to honor those too. So I think using that client as an example, whatever they're coming in with, start listening for the parts language within it. And then you can go there with some of the conversations we have. Another way I will broach is what I've already mentioned. Ask people what stories they connect to, what mythologies they connect to. And then you can follow that up with, well, so which Harry Potter house do you most identify with? Or which golden girl do you most identify with? But do you ever feel like there are some of the other aspects of those in you? Like that's another beautiful way to start par- talking about this. And then you can always go in with the good old, does it ever feel like if they don't volunteer it, does it ever feel like there's a part of you that wants to do this work? And we could use EMDR as an example, that there's a part of you that wants to do this EMDR reprocessing work and a part of you that's kind of you know resisting it or hold or putting up a wall to it. And then you could use those conversations. And yes, there's always the risk, but this is the impact of stigma, right? Where people are like, are you saying I have multiple personalities? And so that, you know, you still have people who might take umbrage with you kind of going in with, with the parts thing. And this is where Schwartz and Gruber and Fadiman and, and, and their writing have done a lot of, just because you do parts work does not mean that you have what was formerly called multiple personalities now has DID. And I see what they're doing because of the impact of stigma, but something I've even challenged Dr. Schwartz on. And if people have DID, what's the big deal? And that's where I'm at as an advocate, where I say, and I think Rotem, you're wearing the shirt that says dissociation is not a dirty word. No, it's down a little low uh, for the Zoom screen. But uh, yeah, and, and the fact that people still get like dodgy about it is because of how much media stigma, especially, has pathologized dissociative identities. Right. And this is where I think you picked up where maybe Dick Schwartz, you know, he depathologized parts, but then you talk more specifically about dissociation and you talk about dissociation again in your book, Dissociation Made Simple, as you use the metaphor of a, a dance. And if I can quote again, uh, you're saying dissociation is not just one thing. Continuing the dance metaphor, dissociation can be a series of steps, movements, and postures used in different combinations and at different times. Sometimes the steps work gloriously, other times they do not, or they can even leave the dancer prone to injury if executed improperly at the wrong time or for too long a duration. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I I mean, there's a lot of metaphor that we could use. And the thing with working with dissociative systems, we tend to love metaphor. It's not to say that you won't encounter a person who absolutely hates metaphor because they exist, but systems tend to, people who are systems tend to think a lot in metaphor. Uh, And yeah, dance is, is one of those metaphors that there's a lot of different ways to dance. And if you're pushing yourself too hard with certain dance steps, it can hurt you. But life, I think I go on to say this in the book, life can be a cruel and unpredictable partner. And a lot of the skills of dissociation teach us how to dance with life, right? Right. But uh, I think I could keep it even simpler for the time and the duration that we have. And this is what a lot of dissociation made simple contributors said that the skills of dissociation can be both a superpower and a disability. Now, many contributors directly said, dissociation is my superpower. It not only helped me to survive a traumatic upbringing, it still helps me in the present moment. Like a lot of people who follow my work online, which I see a lot of friends here and familiar names, I often get the, Jamie, how do you do it all types of question? And it's like, cause it's not just one of me. <laughs> I have parts on board with me who help me get a lot of stuff done. And don't get me wrong. 
that can turn into more of a disability phenomenon if we overwork ourselves. And if our superwoman, Dr. Jamie Park gets too exhausted, she is prone to crashing. I think having dissociative gifts has allowed me to be a chameleon in a lot of these spaces, does allow me to be somebody who navigates life skillfully. But of course, untreated, unhealed dissociation can cause its share of problems, especially if you lose time that puts you in, and that can put you in unsafe situations. Uh, if it's pro prohibiting you from really being present with your clients or, or your children or people you care for, yeah, that is where we can really look at it as potentially a problem. But something that Elizabeth Davis, who is my personal therapist, who outed herself as my personal therapist for the book, and you know, I, I just love Elizabeth. But she said in working with dissociative clients, the gift for her or the, the the trick for her becomes how do we still keep the gifts of it, but work with where it may cause impairment. And I know that's what my treatment journey has been through the years. How do I recognize where dissociation might be causing problems for me, but how can I still use the gifts? And as I'm doing now in a lot of my work, declare proudly that this is nothing I'm ashamed of, that having a system is nothing I want to eradicate because right. the system that I have helps me grow into who I've been meant to grow into in the world. Yeah, I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit, maybe a little personal thing, Jamie, but I know you shared some of your, four of your parts and how you, I think it was your four-year-old that can really detect, like, Dr. Jamie cannot access if you really feel safe with someone. It's your four-year-old. It's this young part that it doesn't have all the, to use non-clinical term, all the bullshit that we have, that we, you know, have as adults. Your four-year-old can really access information. I don't know if information yeah, yeah. is the word, but access this yeah, no safety with people. Let's go there because I, you know, I see a really, really good question coming through right now that I think goes here too. I'm going to answer it. And any of my friends who might be on this call that want to weigh in too, uh, you know, I certainly welcome you to do that in chat. So one of our participants is saying, I would love to hear more specific examples about dissociative gifts as folks I work with are much more clear about the shame of it, ways impedes functionality. First of all, a lot of that shame is a product of media stigma and our field, both. So if they've seen previous therapists who have been scared and frightened of them being a dissociative system, that can produce a lot of the shame. And I've already talked about media stigma, that you're crazy, you're killers, you're psychotic, it's about to you know, go down. Gifts. So a lot of the gifts of dissociation, which is a whole chapter title in Dissociative Dissociative Simple, something that Rotem mentioned, that my four-year-old part, who sometimes goes by Lucy, she is wonderful at telling me who the good people in my life are, who are safe, who are safe enough, who I can be myself with. That is how I make a lot of judgment calls, especially in this later part of my career about, you know, who I want to connect with professionally about who like Rotem, you know, like my, as an example, my four-year-old part has always felt incredibly safe with him because she knows who's accepting us as we are. And so learning to listen to her has been very valuable. I want to tell you about my nine-year-old part. So she is, <laughs> I love her and I'm, I'm trying to tell her right now, I'm going to talk to, I'm going to talk about you. <laughs> you may not like the way that I'm going to talk about you. She's a badass. And she actually started life very much as a curmudgeon. She was the one who engaged in self-injury at first. She was the one who really was just sick of all of this, but in her healing and, and a lot of the EMDR she's experienced, she's now turned into the part that really tells it like it is for us, especially when we listen to her and when we take care of her. So this was 2018, not too long after we came out, we were getting out of our bad post-divorce romantic relationship. And it was around Christmas and we were feeling a lot of this, we got to go to yoga this morning and we have to do our meditation and we have to connect with our positive social supports and we have to stay positive. And it was like our nine-year-old said to us, Jamie, when you go into that positive stuff, you sound like mom. 
Mm. It's like, you know, come on, we, we got to keep moving. We got to keep back. So would you just let yourself be sad? And at her encouragement, we literally just laid down on the couch and let ourselves be sad for four days and treated the kids to what they wanted to treat themselves to. And it passed because she told us it was time to just sit still and be sad. So the parts, and, and Rotem is making available handouts because I did put together like a uh, slideshow version of this workshop, but this, this short course, but I much rather prefer what Rotem and I are doing, just talking about it. But something I have in the slides is, is like a 101 review of what I think you have to understand about dissociation in the first place before you even get into this, these conversations about parts, that dissociation exists to either protect or to meet a need. Dissociation comes from a Latin root, meaning to sever or separate. And it means to protect, it exists to protect or to meet a need. So even all of these parts that seem to be causing your clients trouble, taking a breather and a break to ask, what's their function here though? How are they protecting you? What are they protecting? How do they help to meet a need? Uh, a friend here is using the comment of the palette, like colors on a color palette, uh, as an artist would use. Uh, they really help you to paint your safety and your world in the way that you need to. And so, yeah, that's that's just a couple thoughts I have on it. Yes. So Jamie, I, I do want you to share your, I know you prepared some slides. I just dropped the handouts in the chat and we also have it in our community. I dropped it in, in the community platform. I will do it again after the your presentation. Uh, but I want to read one more quote from Dissociation Made Simple and uh, just you know, just hear your thoughts about that. In the book, again, you're saying, if a person with a dissociative disorder is going to attempt EMDR therapy, they must do it with a therapist who is unafraid of dissociation and skillful in navigating its manifestations. Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, I can. And I'm looking at a question here from a participant that I think goes along really well with that. They're saying, I have clients that dissociate when doing specific target assessments. I want to help the client using EMDR, but I'm a little nervous. So one thing I would ask any EMDR therapist, or especially a new EMDR therapist, is what were you taught about dissociation in your basic training? Because there are still basic trainers out there who can impart this message that you want to avoid dissociation like the plague that dissociating is always bad. You know, dissociating is maybe in this question, preventing somebody from even doing a target assessment. So like, if that's the case, like you're doing a target assessment and you start to notice some of the first signs of dissociation, my first piece of direction without knowing the client's specifics would be, all right, this is what I'm noticing right now. Can you help me understand what's going on? You be curious about the dissociation instead of trying to shut it down. And what that might be telling you is maybe we need to work on another target. Maybe there's not consensus amongst the part system that this is the correct target we should be working on. Those are just some examples. And I would say if you're a new EMDR clinician and you're still stuck, please consult with somebody who is... I don't even want to say well-skilled in working with dissociation, but not afraid of working with dissociation. And here's the difference between being, you know, well-skilled and not afraid. Like I will work with any DID system or any dissociative client any day of the week, because it is something that doesn't scare me because it's been so normal to my experience, right? And I would say if you're an EMDR therapist, especially a new EMDR therapist who gets scared of dissociation, and often that fear comes from this place of not wanting to do more harm. And so I do want to honor that and validate that. But also can have you consider that dissociation has been the most secure skill that your client has likely had to keep them safe over the years. And if they are dissociating during a session, it's because something doesn't feel safe. So how can you use 
the skills you have to ground, to orient, to start opening up a conversation and then being able to ask what's happening here. How is a need being met? How are you being protected? And how do we course correct, so to speak? The other myth I like to bust, which might be bit too big to do in an hour and a half workshop, but like Rotem will talk about, I'm doing an extended course here in the EMDR learning community. I have books. I have a lot of things for free out there where, where you can get more on this. And I just associated briefly about what can I get into in an hour and a half course, uh, course correcting. Let me see. <laughs> it's gone. It'll come back if it's meant to. Uh, it'll come back if it's meant to. But but to your, your core question about not being afraid. Oh, a big, I, I remember it now, a big myth that is out there amongst DMDR trainers. And this is one of the reasons I decided to come out because I, I was sick of hearing this is that people cannot process or people cannot do EMDR if they're dissociating. Most of the EMDR processing I've done over the years has been in a light degree of dissociation. It's the only way many of us can. Right. And you're saying yourself, you personally, it's your own personal it. EMDR work, not, not as a therapist, but as a client. As a client. Yeah. Because yes, dissociation is often taught as something that can happen on a continuum, on a spectrum. That yes, if somebody is dissociating so severely, or if somebody is in a big dissociative flashback, yes, it may not be safe to continue. And you may have to do your, your pause, your stop, your skills to, again, regroup and see what needs to happen next. But for a lot of us, the actual reprocessing itself, we need to leverage a light degree of dissociation to even withstand what is coming up. And that's where you can ask your clients questions like, let's say you're in phase four. Are you okay to keep going with that? Instead of automatically assuming, go with that. If you are starting to see some of the first signs of dissociation. Another thing you can gently say is a person's name, especially the primary name they use if they're a system like Rotem. Rotem, what are you noticing now? It's just a nice, you know, grounding way to say I'm here. The other thing, and we teach this in the ICM program is sometimes a gentle pause is all someone needs in the middle of an EMDR reprocessing session that we're kind of taught at least in very standard EMDR, you either go with it or you stop because a person wants to stop. Sometimes people just need a minute. Sometimes people just need a minute. And that's where you can, again, use the skills for re-anchoring, reorienting, regrounding, and then, all right, where are you at now? What do yeah, you know? And, and please don't use a foghorn to oh, yeah. orient your client to the present moment. Yeah. Don't, don't snap at a client, clap at a client, do this in front of their face or use a foghorn. Yeah. And dissociation made simple. There's a, one of our contributors, Alicia, who actually works for me, talks about when she was in an eating disorder treatment facility, dissociation was so seen as like the worst thing you can do. If the primary therapist caught somebody dissociating in group, he would foghorn them. Unbelievable. And would encourage them to get a foghorn and foghorn themselves to like, you know, come back into the present. Even for those of us who are still pretty functional now, the present can still suck. <laughs> Look at the world we're living in. So leveraging light degrees of dissociation might be the only way that, that we can do this, right? Yeah. I don't remember who it is because you uh, brought a lot of contributors to the Dissociation Made Simple project, but... One of them said, if it wasn't for the association, I wouldn't be alive today. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I just want to say, I'm seeing a lot of questions come through. A lot of them I cannot answer because they're very specific client questions. And that's more the purview of consultation. Um, in the course that I'll be doing here for the learning community, the hour and a half like this will be more set up for questions. I'm catching some of them as they're coming through. There's just so many people on the call. And so as I catch one that's relevant to what we're talking about, I want to emphasize it. So somebody's asking, are you referring to the dual awareness where one foot is in the past and one foot is in the present? 
no dual awareness is really how EMDR works that for EMDR to work effectively for somebody, there does have to be kind of one foot in the past, one foot in the present. Yeah. We could make a case that that is adaptive dissociation for sure. But part of what I mean by gentle dissociation, like some people need to be in a light degree of dissociation in order to process. It just might be like, my eyes are a little floaty. I might not want to make eye contact with you as the therapist. Doesn't mean I'm gone. Totally. Another thing that I think can scare EMDR therapists who have not explored their own dissociation, their own internal world, or who have not had a chance to talk to other dissociative systems, right? Is when the parts show up during reprocessing. Because I know some of you are well-trained in like integrating IFS with EMDR, integrating ego states with EMDR. So bringing the parts in is, is no big deal. But if you've, if you started an EMDR target and you're not aware that there's a part system, it could be that all of a sudden a very young self, a very young voice shows up. And that can scare people who are new to this work thinking, you know, I did something wrong because I made them dissociate. Please don't ever say this isn't what's supposed to happen <laughs> or I don't know what to do. If a part shows up, you ask it about itself, themselves. You know, can you tell me what's making you show up right now? Did something we just do in this therapy thing make you feel like you had to come out and say something? I think because there's a lot of fear, especially amongst the newly trained, I'd like to share with you a, a story from my very recent client work. So it was a person who was a previously diagnosed dissociative system. They had a good, solid understanding of their system, right? And they came in, you know, to do EMDR specifically, they requested it. They made a lot of my preparation work easy for me because they had a list of all the resources that worked really well for their system. And so we, we did about eight or nine sessions of EMDR reprocessing, and it was done with the full consent of all the parts of the system. And then in about the ninth or 10th session, a new part introduced themselves at the beginning of the session. They came in and said, hello, my name, we'll just use a, a pseudonym. Hello, my name is Bird. You haven't met me yet. And I just said very curiously, hello, Bird, it's nice to meet you. What can you tell me about yourself? And Bird introduced themselves. Bird was able to tell me why they came out now. And then I eventually asked them what the time we had. So Bird, you've been watching this EMDR thing that we've been doing, right? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. And so I asked Bird, would you like to try it? Sure. And so we did that week's worth of processing, you know, with, with Bird. Because this is another area of controversy within EMDR where you can get 10 different dissociation consultants around a table and get 10 different opinions. You know, there are some especially people who are very much adherent to the model of structural dissociation who believe that you should be processing with the ANP only, you know, the apparently normal part, which is terminology I just cannot stand, right? And, uh, you know, there are others of us, especially those who are kind of less afraid of dissociative systems, who can very much feel like you work with who shows up, but you do it with respect to kind of how the whole system is receiving the work. Where else do we want to go, Rotem, in the time? Uh, that yeah, so I, I think that in a few minutes, we're going to go to some Q&A, you know, ask people to join us. But I know you prepared, the, uh, you know, some slides if you want to share yeah. your screen and show a little bit of your... I'm thinking based on some of the questions that I'm seeing, it would be helpful to show a couple slides and then we'll take some questions. So... um you know, I guess I want to give away the title of the workshop, which is, you know, the only parts model you'll ever need. People ask me all the time, especially somebody who's out, Jamie, what model do you use with working with parts? And my short, smart ass answer 
is all of them and none of them. Because they all, at least the ones I'm going to highlight that we have knowledge of in the field, they've all shared with me something that's useful. But they all have serious limitations if you're truly working with a dissociative system. So I would actually kind of use Dick Schwartz's words. Listen to your clients. Kurt Roundson, my first mentor in EMDR, who I really took seriously in dissociation, is listen to your clients. Listen to your clients. And they will tell you how their internal world is set up. And then you can use that as a roadmap for how you conceptualize EMDR. Now I say that knowing, cause I've trained a lot of EMDR therapists over the years. I have consulted a lot of EMDR therapists over the years. I see the questions that are coming through, right? Some people, some therapists do very well with what I just told you. Other therapists can feel very much, but I want a model that tells me exactly what to do. And yeah, you can take courses on all of these models, on IFS, on ego state, on structural dissociation, on Fraser's table. But I will tell you this, a dissociative client, somebody with a dissociative disorder is still going to throw you a curveball. The model will fail you. And so how can you use the feedback that they're giving you and your own understanding of dissociation to adapt accordingly? So a big feature of my work, both in Dissociation Made Simple and in Power of Process, which is the extended course I'll be teaching here for the learning community. This answer frustrates a lot of therapists. I'm the first to admit. You got to know your own relationship with dissociation as a therapist, how you dissociate in your life, how your internal world of parts works. And when you can get more comfortable with that, you'll be able to navigate a lot of these questions yourself. And I even go as far as to say, yeah, training is great. You know, if you want to sign up for training with me, wonderful. But if you're still stuck on the what about clients who types of questions, your money may be better spent booking a good dissociation based consultant. Who again is, is not afraid to even take these questions on. So What's the only model you'll ever need for working with, with clients and parts and EMDR therapy is to listen to your clients and to draw from where you can, but to know that no perfect model is going to tell you exactly what to do. And I feel so strongly about this. If anybody pitches a course out there and tells you, I will teach you exactly how to work with DID clients in 10 easy steps, you're being lied to. Because any client who is a dissociative system will, using the baseball metaphor, throw you curveballs. So many contributors to Dissociation Made Simple said, you got to throw your textbook out the window when you're working with me. And even when I was a young therapist who had a diagnosis myself, but was still trying to figure out like how to treat people with this, I read When Rabbit Howls, which is one of the most compelling memoirs on DID. It was one of those where it was co-written with some input from uh, Trudy Chase was her fronting name by her psychiatrist. And the thing I even learned from her psychiatrist is he said very plainly, I didn't know what I was doing. Nobody can ever really prepare you for working with the client, especially with DID. Uh, The memoir is called One Rabbit Howls. Something I say in Dissociation Made Simple is DID memoirs specifically can be very heavy. So read with caution. That one is a very heavy one, yet it's also one of the very well done ones. So I totally went off, went went down another thing there. Yeah. So that is definitely the case if you're working with dissociation disorders or dissociative disorders like OSD, DID. The other thing that I want to also maybe truth tell if if you weren't trained by me or, or my organization, right? is that I know we're taught, or many of us are taught how to use a lot of these screening devices, like the DES, like the MID, you know, all of that. And in a perfect world, you will know what you're getting into with your client before you get into it with EMDR. That's what a lot of these proponents of of these screens teach. And I give DESs. I mean, I don't think they're necessarily bad to give, but just be aware that a lot of people have a protector part 
that tell you exactly what you want to hear on these assessments, on the MID, on the DES. So you may do all of this prep work with the person and think like, you know, there's no dissociative risks. They don't have any significant parts. And then you actually get in there and start reprocessing. And then that's when the system or the person feels vulnerable enough with you to reveal themselves. And that is where it's your comfort with dissociation, with parts, with systems that is going to help you navigate what the client most needs. So let me show a couple of the slides I did prep, and then we can go to some questions. Uh, this is a little piece that I recently put together. Trust me, there's a lot of me that has ethics issues around using artificial intelligence for artwork. <laughs> Yet I did use an AI program to kind of put how I see my parts that exist within my system today. And we've recently, like our system name is the unicorn system. A lot of people who have dissociative identity or other dissociative disorders will name their system. Some people won't, they'll just use Jamie plus, but uh, this is very much how we see our four, our nine and our 19 year old part. Uh, this is us chronologically at those ages. And you know how our system formed quite frankly is that very bad things happen to us at four, nine, and 19. And a separate part really developed to help us be able to navigate what was happening in life at, at that time. So I talk more about my system in Dissociation Made Simple and uh, the Power of Process course that the learning community is hosting here. Uh, I'll be getting into more of, of those nuances. So as we said, dissociation means to divide or to sever. The biggest thing I would want you to understand today in this workshop, knowing that there's more knowledge that can be had, is dissociation generally happens to protect or to meet a need. And that can be the general dissociation that we all do in life, whether you have a disorder or not. Because here's another news flash: you have all dissociated. If you're on this call today, at some point in your life, especially to navigate or deal with stress or trauma, you have dissociated. So what can you learn from that experience about what your clients might be dealing with on a more regular basis? So I would say <laughs> these bottom four bullet points are the major parts models, if you will, either for understanding dissociative disorder parts or the kind of parts that characterize all of our psyches. We've talked about internal family systems. One of the handouts that you have that you've been given access to is a preview from the Dissociation Made Simple flip chart, which is coming out in June, where I do give a little more of a summary of internal family systems, Fraser's table, and Jungian archetypes. Uh, ego state work is uh, rooted in psychoanalysis. It is this idea that there's unresolved material and a common kind of archetype. I don't think they'd use language of archetype, but a ego state example would be something like the frightened child. And they might not exist within the eternal world in as separate and distinct of a way as a dissociative part, but uh, ego state work could certainly give you an understanding of where a lot of people are coming from. And a lot of people in the EMDR community, namely Robin Shapiro, Sandra Paulson, Katie O'Shea, have done a lot that have been more connected to ego states. Uh, Fraser's Table, which is the work of a psychiatrist, George Fraser, it, the paper came out in 1991, is really what introduced the conference table metaphor to us. What's fascinating to me though, is both in from Fraser's Table and in Jungian Archetypes, there is room to enrich the metaphor. So the conference table, yes, is a common metaphor, but consider how a lot of us with dissociative systems don't really resonate with the table, but we do use the metaphor language of a van or a car. And we'll often talk about the part that's in charge is the part that's driving the car. Much more on this in both Dissociation Made Simple and in the course that I'll be teaching here for, for the community. But I would really want us to emphasize on this slide, the point that I led off with, that Rotem led off with, that if you look at indigenous approaches to psychology, a person's mythology is their reality. 
So how they see the stories they connect with playing out in their internal world is a really great access point for even beginning your discussion about parts. And we will cover this in great depth in uh, the Power of Process course, helping you as a therapist who has maybe not yet explored your parts and helping your clients really hone in on a metaphor that works for them. It may not be a conference table. It might be a band or an orchestra or seeing the Harry Potter houses positioned with each other or like the characters in the Wizard of Oz, which is what I mentioned. And then once you and the client can get a good working metaphor going, it really does help you with your EMDR conceptualization. So here's just a couple quotes from Dissociation Made Simple. You can read on your own. Some of you have checked out the entire book. But a question I think I would leave you with is how would you map your internal world? And if this is something as a therapist you haven't done yet, my strong suggestion would be that you do that for yourself first before you begin trying to really guide clients in this work. And yes, you could do this with IFS. You could do this with Ego State. You can do this with doing your own Fraser's table. Whatever model you've been exposed to, great. Or maybe after this course, some of what I've said about metaphor and my own system and mythology has struck a chord with you and you can create your own very informal parts map. And it can be something like this beautiful graphic, which uh, a designer made for uh, the dissociation made simple flip chart. Maybe it's, it's figures or textures or symbols around the table that is your heart and mind. I also in the slides before we go to questions have many, many resources available specifically of people like myself with lived experience who are teaching on this now. The lived experience movement is, I, I hate that it's a movement. It, it should just be a thing, right? But the people with lived experience on DID dissociation or really any condition are the true experts on the condition. And so I'm out, I'm one of the more higher profile people who's out, but there are a lot of other organizations that are doing good work and, and providers who are also doing good work in this area of being out about dissociative disorder. So as EMDR therapists really get to know a lot of these resources uh, as well. An infinite mind, we're actually, a lot of us on this call are preparing to go to the annual conference here. It's a great organization that was founded by a preschool teacher with DID because she was went to like a big level mental health conference one year on trauma and dissociation. And they told her she wasn't welcome because she was a client. And so she ended up starting her own conference, which brought together clients and therapists and loved ones and supporters. So it's very common at this conference to see a client and their therapist present together. We also have another great recommendation, the movie Petals of a Rose. If you've not checked this out yet, it was made by the son of a woman with DID. He did this as his film school final project. And he is really impassioned about teaching on DID through a more accurate lens. And so it's a short film. You could watch it for free online. I would watch it for yourself first for your own educational learning. And then there's both the full version and a, a cut version that you can end up showing to clients to, to start discussion about if what this character Rose experiences is something that they relate to in any way. Uh, in a lot of my courses, uh, I do teach a course through Institute for Creative Mindfulness on occasion called Dissociation Made Simple Now, which is the content of the book. But we do show this movie and discuss it from an EMDR lens in that course. And then I'm also happy to announce myself and the Crumplers both will be presenting this film from an EMDR lens at the EMDR HAP conference this summer in Philadelphia in August, because I think it's a movie all EMDR therapists should watch to get a better acquainting with uh, DID and how it can really show up. So, Rotem, let's take some questions, but do you want to first kind of talk about what you're offering here in the EMDR learning community? Yes, absolutely. What you're offering, actually. Oh, yes. What we're offering. So I want to say that I'm really excited about this structure of this course. Um, 
I, it's something that I've been thinking about for years that trainings can be done in a more effective way. And the way we structure this course is that Jamie is going to teach it over a course of a month. So week to week, you will have a chance to watch some recorded videos and meet with Jamie and ask Jamie directly some questions and then go and work with your clients and try what you learned in the course and come back the next week and ask Jamie some questions again. So kind of fine tuning your understanding and your skills and feel more comfortable. So I'm going to share my screen for just a minute and show you that the course in the EMDR learning community. So if you're in the EMDR learning community and you go to EMDR courses, you will see it here, the power process in healing. And um, if 397 is too much for you, we also have, if you scroll down, can you see my screen, Jamie? Yes. Right okay, good. Yeah. If you are going to the preview here, which should be accessible for everyone, we have, you know, a little more detail about what the training is offering. But if you hit re res reserve your spot now, uh, it also offers four payments over four months. So we just want to make sure that everyone who wants to take the, the course is just that for it to be more accessible. So uh, do you want to say, Jamie, a few words? We have all the information here. So again, if you go to the, the course uh, about the date, so we, we will have a, it's a hybrid model that people don't have to take days off of their training. They will, you will have the opportunity to watch some recorded webinars to be available March 1st and then live meeting with Jamie on Wednesdays throughout March. So I am going to stop sharing my screen. And if there are any questions now about the content of what Jamie has taught us and about the training, uh, you're more than welcome to drop it in the chat. And <laughs>